Welcome to the Infinite Monkey Cage, a science show that offers no guarantees due to the uncertainty of the world and the universe beyond it, both statistically and in a quantum mechanical sense. So this all could be conjecture, but good, solid, empirical conjecture, nevertheless. <laughs> uh, I'm Robin Ince. And I'm Brian Cox. This week we're going to be looking at randomness, probability and chance. So in the absolutely literal spirit of one possible meaning of the potentially infinite set of meanings, both real and imagined of Infinite Monkey Cage, we took a tombola wheel with all the letters of the alphabet on it, spun it 21 times, noted down each letter and created a title. It was... The Infinite Monkey Cage. <laughs> what are the chances of that? 1 over 26 to the power of 21. Yeah, and I should actually be honest and say that Infinite Monkey Cage wasn't the first set of letters that came up. The first one was actually uh, you and yours, but uh, that seems ridiculous. Uh, to help us discuss randomness, probability and chance, we kept with the theme and pulled names out of a hat to decide who the guests would be. And then we decided it wouldn't really work with our guests Lindsay Lohan and the Lord Privy Seal. Um, <laughs> Anyway, we couldn't get the Lord Privy Seal's number. And also, it turned out it's the hat used by I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here. So, uh, Lord Privy Seal's going to be pretty exciting in that locust round. Well, <laughs> well, our first guest is a 1 in 23 chance of having a number one single, a 1 in 47 chance of refusing to go on stage if he has a veruca or a corn, but a 1 in 3,975 chance of saying, the thing about my crystal is that without it, my chakra just goes haywire. Now, as a <laughs> composer of the new musical of Roald Dahl's Matilda and about to embark on an arena orchestral tour, rationalist music, Musician and comedian Tim Minchin. Our other guest is one of the few people to have written a book on mathematics and ghost written the autobiography of a world famous footballer. Though Bertrand Russell did co write Principia Mathematica and attempted to ghost write an autobiography of Nobby Styles. <laughs> it's the author of Pele and Alex's Adventures in Numberland, Alex Bellos. Uh, Alex, uh, I suppose at the simplest level, probability is the study of chance. And uh, I suppose the natural reaction to that is to think, well, chance, completely random events, how can you possibly study it? It must be entirely random. So how, how does a mathematician begin to study chance? Well, that's the thing. We, we can't predict the future for one event. So if there's something that's got a 50-50 chance of happening, tossing a coin, we don't know what's going to happen. But if we were to take a million events toss a coin a million times, we can be pretty sure that round about 50% of the time it'll be heads, 50% of the time it'll be tails. So once we have a mathematical language, we can understand you know, where probability is going to go in the long term. One of the problems with once it actually gets to numbers, generally, there is something that bamboozles the human brain right from the start. What is it? What do you think it is about the human brain that makes, for some people, the understanding, the comprehension of the meaning of numbers? Well, I mean, there are two things. One is numbers and one is probability. I think lots of people, mathematicians, understand numbers. You know, lots of people here will understand numbers. But probability is really, really difficult to understand and mathematicians, it's full of pitfalls and mistakes. So this idea that I might come along and be able to explain probability to you... you it's unlikely <laughs> to be true. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, um, I was going to say there's a disclaimer. C.S. Pierce, a very famous American mathematician, said, you know, in no other branch of mathematics is it so easy for experts to blunder, as in probability theory. So, you know... If I make lots of mistakes, that means I'm a good mathematician. <laughs> yeah. Tim, you, uh, your songs, I suppose, many of them are based on irrational beliefs, irrational thought. So, could I ask you, do you have any songs about probability to start with? Well, not, I don't have a probability song. <laughs> uh, Why? <laughs> there's a reasonable chance I'll write one in the future. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I've got a song called If I Didn't Have You, which is uh, about love and the notion of fate and soulmates and stuff. And that's got lyrics in it like, uh, your love is one in a million, you couldn't buy it at any price, but of the 9.999,000 other possible loves, statistically, some of them would be equally nice. And uh, <laughs> it also says, um, I think you're special, but you fall within a bell curve. So, you know, <laughs> there's, um, yeah, I, I, quite often I find myself saying, what are the odds in my shows to make the point that they're reasonable. <laughs> they're generally, generally the answer to that question is like, you're uh, 1 over 27 to the power of 21 or whatever, that you, you can find them eventually. Have you ever written a song and thought, this is a great song, but it's actually statistically inaccurate? And therefore, because <laughs> that's the thing, is you are involved and you write about rationalism, you write yeah. about science, you write about, so you actually go, that this is, I've got a problem. I can, I can correctly rhyme this, yeah. but this will make it inaccurate. Or <laughs> Yeah, there, there's, there's two things. One, I, I do have an obsession with making my songs thorough, which is why they're usually about two minutes longer than is fun. And... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and the other thing is I try to keep myself just a, sort of 
just stupid enough so that I can justify being stupid. Which isn't to say I need to work very hard to keep myself that stupid. I just mean I, I try to make it apparent that I'm not actually claiming to know anything. <laughs> Alex, the, the history of the study of probability is uh, interesting to me. I know you, you deal with it in your book. Well, I mean, it's incredibly extent, recent. I mean, it's probably the most recent great idea that mathematics has had, which is this idea that we can sort of predict the future using maths. And you know, it's maybe 500 years old when it was a gambler, in fact. Geralomo Cardano, an Italian, who really was the first person to think about probability, about games of chance and gambling in a mathematical way. Because in Rome, for example, people used to gamble all the time, flip coins, and they would think that if Caesar's head came out top, it was Caesar who had decided that you were going to win. So was probability it? and randomness it was basically sort of superstition. And superstition died not with Nietzsche or with Darwin, but with Cardano, who said, actually, we can work out numerically what the probabilities are of flicking a coin. And he was basically looking at the mathematics of, of gambling, of yeah. gaming. So yeah. he was trying to work out how to, how to design a game such that you could... Well, what he was Winning. doing, he was, Cardano was probably the most interesting person in maths history. He was a doctor, he wrote 131 books, and he also invented lots of interesting maths, including probability. And he did this because he was an inveterate gambler, and he realised that he was losing lots of money. But there were mathematical ways to actually start winning money. So people would gamble using dice the whole time, and he was the first person really to realise that six-sided dice, the chance of throwing a six, is a sixth. And then you can do the maths like that. And that seems to us so obvious. But he was the first person to realise that. And once he realised that, he started making a lot of money and losing it again. <laughs> when you talk about working out probability and when you talk about decisions that you can make and rational decisions, could you, for instance, Tim, live your life by going, hang on a minute, right, I'm just going to work out what is the probability that if I take that action, that will lead to that and that's the required moment? Or does it in turn, does it become a mathematical exercise in living? I think I do live my life like that. It's in my nature to try to shed any superstition from any decisions. I actually consciously work on making sure I've got no superstition left. The thing I always try to do if a loved one's getting on a plane is say, I hope you have a crash, uh, you know, um, <laughs> but just because I, I like taking control of what is a very difficult instinct. The toughest superstition I've got that I've had to try to rid myself of is the touch wood superstition, the idea that I go, I've never had a car crash, Ooh, you know, as if your words can change the universe, but it's so embedded in us that we think we're special. We basically think we're special. I think it's totally fine to have these little superstitions to make people feel better, to be able to fly easier. It's just when you, know, you lose all your money because you go gambling, yeah. it becomes a problem. And well, you know, prob misunderstanding of probability means that people can be conned really easily, and lots of people are conned. Alex, you, know, you tell the story of the, the way that um, your, our natural sense of, of coincidence and probability can, can mislead us. And you tell the story of the woman who won the lottery in New Jersey twice in, was yes. it in four weeks. Yeah, in four months, I in think four it months. was. So tw two lottery wins in four months. Yeah. And the, the newspaper... The newspaper said this was a you know, one in 17 trillion chance of that happening. And it was a one in trillion chance of any person going and buying one ticket on that day and then going and buying the other ticket. But that's not the way probability works. If there are thousands or millions of people actually buying lottery tickets, it turned out mathematicians did the math on it, so to speak. And the chance of any one person winning two lotteries in America in any four-month period is about 25%. So it's actually quite a, you know, a probable thing to happen over a course of a few years. It sound, it's completely counterintuitive, isn't it? Which I think is the, perhaps the origin of superstition and a misunderstanding of many events that happen. You think there's no chance of that. You, know, yeah, you bump absolutely. into a friend that you've never seen for 10 years walking down the street in London, you think it's, it's a sign. Coincidences happen a lot more than you think. And the most famous way of sort of showing that coincidence happened is what's called the birthday paradox, which isn't a birthday paradox at all, which is how many people do you need to have in a room together? For it to be more likely than not that two share the same birthday. We're going to get to that. Yeah, we are. Yeah, <laughs> birthday paradox. Can we have a little bit later? <laughs> birthday paradox. <laughs> later on in the show. <laughs> if you'd sung that for just two seconds longer, we would have had to pay you royalties. What a pity you missed that. <laughs> birthday <moment>. paradox. <laughs> ox, ox, ox. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have a problem 
with that lotto example Mm -hmm. the lay idiots way i think of that is that there's very very low possibility of thing a happening but there's loads and loads and loads of things therefore the probability of anything happening is really really good in fact given enough time and enough things the probability of anything happening is always one so i i (laughs) any any event you can think of will eventually happen like existence of human life and all that sort of stuff but where that's not true that if it violates the laws of physics that, yeah. <laughs> Bring Let's out the, call these, <laughs> these laws of physics theories like they really are. <laughs> Why? Why, if, if time well, is infinite, if, theoretically, it's not, but so, so let's if say, it was infinite. Let's say you have a law such as the, the conservation of electric charge, which is based on some... I don't have that law. So, 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 so you can't make a negative charge without a positive charge, which is yeah. the way we think the universe works at the yeah. moment. So, so that's why you can only create matter and antimatter in equal amounts, because you need to... If you're going to make some matter with a positive charge, you need to make an equal amount with a negative charge. Are so you that about, would be an absolute law. Then no matter how long you wait... Yeah, it, sorry. Then no, you're absolutely you're right. Gonna, a physically impossible thing won't happen if it's physically impossible. If there's a possibility that it's not impossible then that will happen <laughs> that, but but i guess what i'm saying is all possible events will happen over enough time yeah yeah but that's yeah precision <laughs> bloody physicists so can we hang on can we get back to the man, please? <laughs> this is radio four it's about precision <laughs> uh, the listeners won't know this but when brian was explaining antimatter and matter he was using it both with his fists in as, as if it were if lock stock and two smoking barrels had been made by the open university <laughs> you would have been a character in it We've got matter over yeah, here, yeah, yeah. antimatter no, over anti-matter. here, and someone, I think, is about to go from matter to antimatter. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. I am a physicist, you are a minstrel, we can move on. <laughs> I'm going butch for the third series. <laughs> <laughs> right now, before we, we have many more questions, and of course we have to deal with the uh, what, what was it we were going to deal with after the next bit? I can't remember. Birthday paradise. Well, thanks, Tim. That was a really <laughs> handy reminder. Now, I didn't think we would need our regular stand-up mathematician Matt Parker on this show, as we already have enough maths, as you can see. But then Matt told me that that would lead to an increase of thirty-seven percent in my likelihood of being attacked by a rook due to the decreasing number of people on stage. Um, <laughs> I don't know that much about rooks, and I'm only just beginning to understand probability. So for that reason, here's Matt Parker. I was on a bus the other day and someone got on and they were wearing exactly the same t-shirt as me. Uh, It was awkward. I thought one of us is going to have to say something. He turned to me and just went, oh, what are the chances? (laughs) Well, (laughs) because we can, We, we could work this out, right? We need to know the density distribution of T-shirts in the population. We could estimate the average frequency wear rate. Uh, You look at the number of people you're close enough to each day to score a match. And if you put all these together, you can work out if our matching T's are significant. It's the the so-called statistical T's test. (laughs) Ah, When I did that in the maths department, it went down a treat. We we all agreed it was over 95% hilarious, so... Who's the outlier now? No. But we can. You can work this out. And if you actually go through the numbers, given the sheer number of people you come across each day, I think it would be more amazing if you never bumped into someone wearing the same thing as you. It's like the media coverage last year of Wang Yang's marriage. Uh, Wang Yang, who lives in China, married his fiance, whose name is also Wang Yang. They've got exactly the same name, and they were both born on the 29th of April, 1982. Identical birthday, identical names. It seems amazing. But you can actually look up the statistics on the number of names used in China, which I did. Um, (laughs) And Yang is actually the sixth most common name in China. There are literally millions of Yangs in China, which is a sentence that gets far more racist the less context it gets. (laughs) To to quote a taxi driver, it's not racist, it's a fact. (laughs) And Wang is actually the second most common name in China. There are actually, at last count, 93 million Wangs in China. (laughs) That's not racist. uh, That's an innuendo. (laughs) It actually turns out that half the Chinese population draw from just 